just on the back of some of that discussion, there's been a few points where people have been thinking about the organisms and the systems which actually resist ocean acidification. And recently I've become more interested in where we don't find change. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So uh, the, the, the history of our field, if you trace it back, we found enormous effects when we looked at single species like coccolithophores, when we did those lab experiments, which were quite sudden, that we call them shock effects now, or we looked at species in isolation, uh, the, the magnitude of the effect sizes of what we were measuring was really quite large. And a lot of us got into the field on the basis of that. There we go. Uh, so what, what I think I'm starting to observe is this movement from stable chemistry those single species vacuums, use of single species, sensitive species at the very short terms, to seeing a bit of a decline in those effect sizes where we tend towards more realism, where the chemical cycles are fluctuating, diurnal cycles, where species are in mixtures in which they naturally occur, where we have diversities of species and start to run experiments over multiple generations. And this is just a hypothetical graph, but it's certainly in my mind and that those early studies tended to show really quite strong effect sizes. But as time has gone on and we've incorporated species which are less sensitive, uh, we're using longer generation times and we're not shocking the creatures. We're actually using vents as well. We're starting to see a lot more scatter around that meme. And as my, um, I've missed a slide's just gone missing there. Let's go back. So, Sean, just very quickly, sorry, um, can you just uh, sw swap your displays around so we can see the full screen? Sure, that might be what's yeah. going on. So, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Now that's at the top, there we go. How's that? Yep, perfect. Great, thank you very much. So um, this is a paper that I published with our, our team here, where we looked at a meta-analysis uh, where we had simple experiments through medium complexity to complex, and what we found is those effect sizes tend to get smaller as we increase complexity. And we go from simple physiological measures, moving up through whole organisms to the communities, we found that uh, ocean acidification would often be measured from a negative to a positive through the nutrient enrichment effect. And when we look at temperature, sometimes we'd find, well, quite often, no major effect until we reach the community level. And these two in, in combination would yield these kinds of effects here from negative through to a scatter of positive and negative. Certainly got me thinking about the departures and made me interested in what kind of organisms we'll be faced with in the future, which are able to withstand this onslaught of acidification. And more importantly, what can we do to actually manage some of those creatures? What can we engage with? What kind of ecological processes or biological processes? So I was interested in this thing called stasis. Our system can undergo a shock, but still stay on track. So how can they resist without change? Here's the theory of the ball in the basin where it doesn't move. This is really different from resilience where you have a change and a recovery, but that's not what we're dealing here with climate change. We're not dealing with a pulse, a temporary situation. What we're dealing with is a ramping effect where the intensity only increases over time. And so these species that will persist in the future with their systems intact, if we're lucky, will need to increasingly have a dynamic that offers resistance. And when I talk about resistance, I am talking about an active process. So if I push you and you fall over and get up again, you've demonstrated some kind of resilience. But if I push you and you don't move, you're actually having some resistance, but you're actually working hard to be able to maintain that. So it is an active process. So the work I'm going to talk about is from uh, White Island. Uh, these are my collaborators, Ivan here, Zoe Doubleday, Tim managed to get on the boat a couple of times, and uh, Jonathan Leung. And I'm going to talk about uh, these kinds of habitats with, and focus on these snails here. Uh, we've been looking at their 
uh, uranium isotopes and tracking their movement. And we think we're dealing with multiple generations that live at these vents. Just straight off, uh, the thing we looked at at the lowest scale, the atomic scale, was what kind of changes would occur in these snails at medium and high acidification. And what we found was that these nano twins, these are linear boundaries between atomic lattices, they actually became thinner and thinner, which actually provides strength. So the density of these nano twins, if you want to call them that, actually increased snail snail's shell strength. So they produced more durable shells. And as acidification increased, so did the durability to an extent. And we could test this. So we use a nano indenter and you can poke these things at very fine scales and measure the crack length, which you can see here. And what we found is they built shells fit for purpose as acidification increased, but up to a point where we get to extreme levels that adaptive response actually declines. So this is pretty interesting that there is this reshuffling at an atomic level that allows these snails to maintain their mechanical strength. And that's an important thing here is that there's the hierarchy, if you think about the hierarchy of life, which I'm gonna build through, that we can get this change, this dynamic at one level that can underpin stability at the next level up. So let's just look at their food. How, how's this enabled? So what we found is that the turfs that they feed on tend to have greater energy content. Whether you look at the proteins, et cetera, there is more energy available to those gastropods which live in these habitats, which is associated with more resilient shells, thicker shells. So there seems to be an energetic basis for this. So CO2 is providing a pathway in which energy is being able to acquire to allow this mechanical strengthening. There's something very odd happening in marine systems in which carbon enrichment enables this to happen. It seems to be something to do with the availability of nitrogen. Uh, we've been contrasting this in, to terrestrial systems. We come up with very similar predictions from our theories, but the mechanisms seem to be very different. I'm very interested in pursuing that in the future. So what does this mean for the next level up, the population level? Well, the key thing is energy again. So we go back for a dive at the vents, and this is what we see. Under those future conditions, we have these thicker mats of turf-forming algae that Ben was talking about, and they're highly productive. So with increase in biomass, we get increase in um, oxygen production, and that's associated with an increase in the abundance of these snails. So there is, that's quite opposite to what we might anticipate, where this is acting as a resource, CO2 is propagating up through the food chain. So what does this mean if we leap up to the ecosystem level, where we're interested in, say, primary production? Would, you, would, you, would it be balanced? If production goes up, could consumption go up so that they're balanced, or do they get out of kilter? So I'm interested in knowing whether or not at that very senior level of the hierarchy of life, whether or not those ecosystem dynamics will shift or whether or not we can get some kind of uh, stabilization. Certainly what we're seeing around vents around the world is there seems to be a tip towards greater productivity and consumption, which allows these systems to somehow get out of whack, but they must be on some kind of journey before they get to that point. And there might be some way in which we can interact with that journey to actually uh, slow it down or use it to some benefit. And I just want to give an example here from Julia Gadeni's work, where what she showed was that as you provide increasing stress, that might be carbon enrichment, nitrogen enrichment in their combination, what we get is this increasing compensatory response by the feeding of these snails. So as turf cover increases along the x-axis here, the consumption actually increases to stabilize the system. We couldn't push that system far enough for it to fall over. But this was extraordinary, the amount of uh, uh, stabilizing impact that we see here. So as producers actually ramp up their performance, they're being chased down by the consumers also ramping up their performance. 
which creates this ability to have some kind of stabilization. So all I've shown you here is at the very bottom of the hierarchy of life at the molecular level to the very top of the, of the hierarchy of life at the ecosystem level, that we can have this adjustment occurring at one scale that allows the next level up to be stabilized. So the theory that I'm interested in pursuing is this idea that adaptation is a multi-level hierarchical process. So it can occur at one level, the atomic level, to underpin physiological stasis, or the physiology may change to underpin an orgasmal status, um, stasis, or we get behavioral change that underpins some population stasis. And I showed how that behavioral change can actually create a community stasis, which might lead to an ecosystem stasis. The problem in trying to work through this theory is that we're all using terms in different ways. We call it adaptability, tolerance, plasticity, phenotypic plasticity. We use it in interchangeable ways at different levels of the hierarchy of life. And it's quite difficult to bring this all together in a coherent way, which we can make sense of. We've used this term adaptation to describe evolution. Uh, we do it in our lab to describe physiological um, changes to underpin stasis, but we don't see people doing it yet. Think about communities and populations and their rearrangements that might stabilize ecosystem properties. So you can imagine as CO2 is an energy source propagates up a food web to the primary producers, to the herbivores, to their predators, and how their consumption might increase as a consequence, we might get some kind of stability. Right, let me go back. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, so just re returning off that point, my sense of this is that as we bring in more realistic mixtures of species, uh, we do experiments over multiple generations, uh, we, we think about the interconnectivity of the trophic systems we're working in and start addressing theories about resistance rather than resilience, which I suspect on many scales we're working on is, is a red herring we might find uh, theories that can predict the kinds of life forms we might see going into the future in which our volcanic vents are a wonderful insight into why that might happen. And I'm just gonna leave you here with one of the last times we went out to White Island. There's Cecilia here, uh, one of our research assistants, Ivan Nagel Kirkham, yours truly, Tim and myself. And I'll open up for questions. Thank you very much.